Okay, so we haven't presented ourselves first <laughs> while Sergio is is trying to connect. <laughs> Good evening. It's such a, ple a pleasure to meet you both. <laughs> Glad to be here. I'm Ines from Portugal. Cesar and Ronald can present themselves too while Sergio is coming. I imagine I should say who I am. I'm Ronald from Brazil. Uh, living far, far away from Sergio, half a continent, practically. And I'm very, very pleased to meet you in this way tonight, this evening. Uh, this is wonderful. Uh, so while we wait for Sergio to come in, I say welcome, it's a pleasure, uh, yet another one of the uh, international Talking Talk interviews. Thank you. Is it Thank you for being you... here, despite all the difficulties. Ronald, could you give me your second name? My second name, it's Kirmse. We have crossed before, though you may not realize it. Because for a short time, I think uh, in the 80s, I was, I'm no good at talking languages, but I was dealing with Quetta, and I was the person who had to make the copies and pass them on. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, I used to be part of the Quetta, uh, not team, but we did correspond, and some stuff of mine got published in Quetta. Yes, that is true. Uh, so nice our paths meet again. <laughs> well, I'm not so important <laughs> like oh Master Ronald. We, we call him Master Ronald because he is the, the big name. He, well, first of all, my name is Caesar. Caesar Machado or Caesar X Machado is X in Portuguese, and I'm talking from São Paulo and Brazil. And with with Sergio, we found the Talk and Talk YouTube channel five years ago, and Ronald is our professor with uh, in this middle earth ways that we we studying enjoying and so many videos we <laughs> use we use all of your information and in books you you can see in in my room i have a, here adventures of tom bombadil the art of the hobbits <laughs> the art of the lord of the rings here the new uh, the new versions of Hoverandom, and I am a tokenist concert for the HyperCollins Brazil. I, I work there, and it's a great pleasure. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, internet. It is, it is. I, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the uh, day for technical issues. <laughs> yes. Christina, so it's a pleasure. Christina, I already know Ronald. Say. Oh, really? I don't know. The old... yes. We I don't think we met physically, but uh, you you were you were, you were you were I think working together with people like David Duggan and Julian Bradfield. Who yes, you were the link. Nice. He was a long time correspondent of mine. We even corresponded in Tengwar, and I think he was the first person who invented or who created a Tengwar font for the for the computer. That's Julian Bradfield, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Ronald was also recognized by John Garth. Uh, he remembered Ronald from the from the, 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 the Elvish, right? Pina Tengwar. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd like to welcome Wayne Hammond and Christina Skoll. It's an honor for us here at Talk and Talk to receive you. And personally, for me, I, I think I shouldn't say because say this because we have another other guests. And but you are my favorite uh, 
couple, my favorite tokenist couple. And I really like the way you write, the, the way you put your studies into paper and your, all, your, all the research you do. I think um, it's very good to, to have your work available for us. And at least around the world, in Brazil, it's a little difficult, difficult because we have so little material uh, published. We we now have uh, a new publisher here. From uh, they started two years ago. It's it's Harper Collins Brazil, and now they are trying to publish everything by token and also about token. Uh, this is especially difficult for us. Everything about token we have to to go for foreign authors, né? Uh, foreign authors, and your work is known here mainly because uh, mainly through the publications of. Roverandom and the old edition, it has your material, but uh, there is nothing too much here. So uh, at Token Talk, we try to bring uh, uh, your material here through the videos. For example, uh, you watch uh, your, the video about your biographies. Uh, it's a little introduction to our public and so that, that they can know you, know what you do. And also there is the video about the, the Lord of the Rings uh, companion, uh, the Reader's Companion. In the future, there, there, is, there will be a video about the Companion and Guide. So uh, uh, in, before we have the, your books or your materials, we try to bring it, to, to bring your materials through the video. Yeah, we're always happy when our books can, can get to more people. Uh, you know, but when you, when you when you publish something as as lengthy as the uh, companion and guide, the, there are not too many uh, uh, too many translations that are made of it. It has been no yes, translation. It, no, no, no translation. The first translation. And this uh, did it without telling us. Yeah. Maybe the first translation can be in Portuguese because uh, the. The new publisher has uh, a plan, a big plan for many books, mm -hmm. and your books is inside of this plan. Lovely. Uh, I think you are talking about uh, the Lord of the Rings, the Reader's Companion, right? Yeah, definitely. No, we're talking about the Companion and Guide. The Reader's Companion has been translated into Spanish. Right. Mm. Um, but that's all. I think, of course, with those books, so many of the people who are interested in them do have pretty good English to read it, to read them in any way. At least they seem they seem so when we look at it, we get a lot of things from people who've obviously read them and it's not their English is not their native language. Yeah. Yes. I, I'm reading the, the the Reader's Companion now because I first read the in English the Fellowship of the Ring, and each chapter I read in Fellowship, then I went to the Reader's Companion. It's a unique experience. There's nothing like it. So I'll do the same with the Two Towers and Return of the, the King. And our wish is that all the public, all the Brazilians could do the same. But unfortunately, unfortunately, the, the language is still an obstacle. Yeah, here in Portugal, we also have to read the uh, things about Tolkien. We don't have much in Portuguese, really. We have to read it. the ones who want, want to do it. We have to do it in, in English. <laughs> Not, so we don't even here have the, the biography from Humphrey Carpenter. We don't even have it here. And it's a, a basic uh, book about Tolkien. Mm. And we'll talk about it in this interview. I, I want to ask you something about it. So uh, to our public, once more, we have an international talk and talk interview. And today we have the honor to receive Wayne Hammond and Christina Skoll. And now uh, Inez, Cesar and Ronald will give our audience a brief background about Wayne and Christina. So let's begin. Uh, I will begin to talk about Wayne. Uh, Wayne Gordon H Hammond, it's Hammond, not Hammond, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, Wayne Gordon Hammond was born in Cleveland, Ohio, in the USA. His early interests range from science fiction and adventure stories to astronomy and oceanography. Wayne earned a Bachelor of Arts degree with honors as an English major at Baldwin Wallace College in 1975. 
and Master of Arts in Library Science from the School of Library Science of the University of Michigan, Ann Harbor, in 1976. From 1976 to June, June 2015, he was assistant librarian at the Chapin Library of Rare Books and Manuscripts at Williams College at Williamstown, and this is a hard one, Massachusetts, Massachusetts. I don't know how to say this. And from July 2015, he has been at the Chapin Librarian. Tell her, go and help her out. Cheaper now. Okay. We were talking about this before. We don't know if it was like French, a French noun, or like no, Charlie's no. Chaplin, Chaplin. No, I, okay. I, I, I frequently address to the Chaplin Library, like Charlie Chaplin. Oh, okay. Or, or the Chaplin <laughs> Library is, is in the, the religious person, or the Chopin Library. Uh, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> In the Chopin Library, I believe they have a an piano, right? <laughs> Inside the library. <laughs> well, they, I will be continuing. They do in one of the art museums in town. <laughs> well, continuing Please the do. history. He has won a Clive S. QB research grant from the Marion E. Wade Center Wheaton College. And he is a five-time winner of scholarship awards from the Metopoeic Society. His work in describing the entire token bibliography led him to meet other collectors, collectors, including his wife. Christina Scull was born in Bristol, England, where she attended the famous Red Maids School. In 1961, she moved to London and worked for 10 years in Board of Trade. In 1971, she received her Bachelor of Arts degree with honors from Birbeck, Birbeck College, the University of London, where she studied art history and medieval history. From 1971 to 1995, she has the library. She was the librarian of Sir John Swain's Museum, London. Stones. Souls. 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 Sir Souls. John Souls Museum, Souls. London. Stones. Yes. This, in, this is a uh, tough one. <laughs> in 1992, Christina was president of the Tolkien Centenary Conference in Oxford. She has won scholarship awards from the Mythopoeic Society four times. Wayne and Christina are great talking enthusiasts and both were longtime members of the Tolkien Society. They first met personally in 1983 at a meeting of the Tolkien Society's London Smile on Wayne's uh, first visit to England. In 1992, at the closure of the Tolkien Centenary Conference in Oxford, they announced their engagement and they got married in December 1994. Individually or jointly, Wayne and Christina have dozens of publications, including books and articles. Among their works, we have The Lord of the Rings, A Reader's Companion, The J.R.R. Tolkien Companion and Guide, J.R.R. Tolkien Artist and Illustrator, The Art of the Lord of the Rings and The Art of the Hobbit. They also edited Rover Random, the expanded editions of Farmer Giles of Ham and the Adventures of Tom Bombadil, and the latest editions of The Lord of the Rings. Nice. As you can see, Ronald is always perfect in English, Portuguese, German, <laughs> Latin, <Russian>. Esperanto, <laughs> Russian. He, that's why he's with us, not only because of his token knowledge, but also because of the language knowledge. <laughs> So let's begin. Uh, okay. As usual, the first question is, how and when did you first get in touch with Tolkien and his works? You uh, came first. I, I <laughs> first read Tolkien when I, well, not, when I was 13. I was still at school and I Actually, I didn't actually have adult, adult library tickets, but, but my parents let me use theirs, and I was standing by the return 
shelf in a local library and a young librarian came up to me and she'd probably been watching what I'd been reading and she picked up a book that had just come back and said I think you would like this <laughs> well I looked at it discovered that it was actually had a summary of a previous volume in the front and started off with something on the lines of Aragorn ran up the hill and I looked at it and I thought well yes I think I would but I'd rather start with the first volume so I waited till that came into the library. I can date it for two reasons. I can still remember the Lord of the Return of the King had not come out. And I could still uh, I could still remember, or shall we say, I have a memory of a memory of saying to my mother desperately, what happens if he dies before he's finished? <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. It, I wouldn't be able to, but in fact I I, I, but I can't remember how The Return of the King affected me when it came out. I can't remember grabbing it. And, and then I kept on borrowing it from the library. And my parents were very delighted, kept on rereading it. My mother was very delighted when they didn't have to take only those three books away on holiday with me because uh, I was a terrible reader. And then in the autumn, early autumn of... Uh, 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 sorry, 56. Uh, I, I took, I, ha I was in this, reading it again and somebody had reserved The Return of the King at the library. And I was desperate. And I had just enough pocket money saved to go up and buy my own first, or rather uh, my first volume. It was still not a first edition at that point of The, Retur of the Fellowship of the Ring, The Return of the King, sorry. It was not a, it was not a, the first edition, but not a first print. Yes, the first edition, but a third print. Yeah. And I still have that one here with the date. I mm. think something like the 15th of October, 1956, written in the front of it. And then, of course, I had to buy the others. And that meant I had to work very hard at school that autumn because my pocket money would mean it would take quite a time. But if I did well at school, my father would give me some extra money. <laughs> so I managed to get the next two volumes on the following two months, or rather the previous two volumes, the next two months. That's how I started. <laughs> nice story. It's a very... I loved it. <laughs> I don't even know how to say you are there from the, the beginning. The beginning. <laughs> <laughs> And, and and so it's so sweet. Yeah. All the scenario is so sweet. Uh, I I took to yeah. to the library and I I've I've been waiting for the thirty four room. Yeah. Uh, so beautiful. <laughs> I don't go back that far. Um, uh, it was I think nineteen seventy five, and uh, I was I was still in high school. Um, I went into an English class, uh, and the uh, the students who had been in, in the previous period had been doing book reports. And if you do a book report, you have to write the title of the book on the chalkboard. And I walked into the room, and there on the chalkboard was The Lord of the Rings. And I thought, that's an interesting title. I wonder what that is. Um, and uh, I think not long after that, I was... Uh, uh, in uh, what we would now call a home improvement store, uh, but it was just a lumber yard at the time. Uh, and every, every place, uh, every, every shop back, back then in the, in the 70s had a, a rack of paperback books. And I saw on the rack uh, the, uh, the second and third volumes of The Lord of the Rings in the old Ballantine edition, original Ballantine with the Barbara uh, Remington, uh, strange yeah, with the light, <laughs> uh, which Horrendous. I thought was very interesting. Uh, so I bought those on a whim, um, uh, 50 cents, 65 cents with uh, back then. Uh, so I had to go out and find the first volume because they didn't have it. Uh, and, um, while looking in a uh, pharmacy, uh, I saw, um, the Hobbit, you know, the enchanting prelude to the Lord of the Rings. I thought, well, I don't know about this. I, I didn't. I didn't grow up with, with Tolkien. It's a trap, Wayne. It's a trap. Yeah. 
I know. Uh, so I thought I'd better buy that. And next uh, next to it was the Lynn Carter book that Ballantyne had also published, uh, A Look Behind the Lord of the Rings, a very early book on Tolkien and his influences. Uh, <laughs> And uh, then uh, not too long after that, I, I did find the Fellowship of the Ring uh, in a supermarket. Uh, so I read The Hobbit uh, and I liked that. Uh, and then I read The Lord of the Rings and that, that really struck me. Uh, and I, uh, after that, I read both of them, I think once a year, every summer. Um, and I probably would still be doing that except We've been writing about Tolkien for so long that now, you know, if I go back to the books, it's for reference uh, or because we're writing something about them. Uh, I think someday I'll, I'll probably you know, just just have the time to sit back and uh, and read them again for pleasure. I do find myself when even when using them for reference, uh, you know, there are certain sections that I can't. I can't, I don't dare to look at because I will start reading them and just keep, <laughs> uh, you know, the ride of the Roker, for example, uh, or the, the, you know, scarring of the Shire. Uh, so that was, that was how I got started in, in the mid seventies. I remember a friend of mine, um, I, I also read them at the time, but just a few years later, it was telling me that I should really grow out of them. Uh, <laughs> that, that, you know, we're really you know, just, uh, for young people, and you should be reading Kafka. Well, I did read <laughs> Kafka, uh, but I'd rather read Tolkien. Very nice. I like, it was a, a bookshop, a pharmacy, and a supermarket to, uh, to actually, make the whole collection. A home improvement store. I actually was not in a bookshop at all. Uh, for, for, for those. It was only after I started to, uh, I became interested in, in, in Tolkien and getting other things by him or about him that I started looking in, in bookshops. And there were a lot more bookshops in those days than there are now. Uh, but there were, not, there were not as many books. There wasn't as much published by Tolkien or about Tolkien back then. I mean, if you had one book a year, you were, you were lucky. Now it's it's a, it's yeah. a flood. Yes. Sure. Here, here in Brazil now we have so so many. I believe all the all the books we have in, in Brazil. But now, it, it, important, so, right? We have to import the books. Yeah, all the the Middle Earth except the, the uh, in English we have. I think we have all 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 of them, but not in Portuguese yet. All English, yes. Inês? Okay, so let's go to another question. This is about your career. Um, how have you managed your careers as librarians and also token scholars? You're retired. Well, I wasn't yeah. Retired, no. I, well, of course, it was very helpful that I had, I had moved to London after I left school. I moved there because I liked theatre and I liked exhibitions and London was the place to go, which meant, of course, that when I eventually, I had collected Tolkien, but not the books as they came out. I, I bought the Smith when it came out, Adventures of Tom Bombadil, a Silmarillion, of course, and the second edition of The Lord of the Rings. And by the time I read the second edition, I could pick up, I had read the first so often that I could pick up all the changes as I went through. Um, but I didn't really collect and do much on Tolkien until um, Brian Sibley did, did the dramatization on The Lord of the Rings. And then I started collecting everything I could by Tolkien. And I mean everything. Reviews, <laughs> going to pieces, making copies from newspapers, any book. I, uh, I'm in the present moment actually cataloging. I have in the in the other room uh, something like 200 scrapbooks filled with cuttings, besides the books. Um, from newspapers, from magazines. Magazines. Yes. yes. A lot of them were printouts, you know. You, and also, I mean, yes, if you get the original, go photocopies or printer. Mm -hmm. uh, well, because you were talking about with Korea, well. 
the fact, because I was in London, I was able to get go to the bookshops, buy things. And when that was when the um, broadcast was on, every bookshop had a display of all the editions. I had two editions of Lord of the Rings already, but I wanted the others. <laughs> I Why wanted, not? I wanted the deluxe. I wanted the Pauline Baines cover and everything else. And so I started collecting. I joined the Talking Society and it was handy that I was in London because although it's wide, although it's of course nation and now worldwide, um, a lot of the stuff did, lots of the people, original, had re- original people were in London. I got to know a lot of the people there. And I just moved into, I was able to go in the evenings to, to, to meetings. And in one thing that was very useful, it, it, one was very difficult. When I first joined the Talking Society and the local and the local talking, North Farthing Smile, which is the London one, at that time, I, had, I worked a Tuesday to Saturday week at the museum. And that meant that I couldn't really do much, start doing anything much with the society because almost all organization was Saturday, which I was working. That's why I ended up doing Quetta because I volunteered to do it because I, I couldn't do anything else. But a few years later, the, we changed, the museum changed and I worked a Monday to Friday, but about one in three Saturdays. And that came in very handy for when I was, we did our first book, because I had to do all the work on, at, at the Bodley. And that meant I could take a day off, but I could take my free Mondays and have a whole day's work at the Bodley to work on the drawings there. So that worked very well with my, my time at the, at the museum. And as for me, um, uh, I mean, I became a rare books librarian in 76 and, uh, <laughs> And, and because I'm, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the nature of the work was bibliographical uh, and the nature of what I was doing with Tolkien was, was largely bibliographical. Um, you know, that, that fit in very nicely. Uh, and uh, not, not, there are not too many librarians at, at uh, the college here uh, who have actually published, at least published a, a, this sort of thing. Uh, it's mainly a, a faculty thing. The professors do it, but the librarians, no, the librarians help other people do that. Uh, yeah. Than, you know. uh, but it's uh, and I've been able to do this uh, not on not on my my business time, but uh, at, at home and, and in my spare time. Uh, although when uh, I look at our shelf of books that we've written or edited, I get exhausted. I think I, you know how do, how on earth did we do that? Uh, you know, how could how could you ever think about doing that? And if you would, if you would imagine there was going to be that much work if you'd done it in the first place. <laughs> like uh, as I, I said, it's, it's, a, it's a trip. <laughs> it's a trip. It's a trip. Uh, what Christina said about living in London and having many bookstores, I went to London in 2018 and then to Oxford to the Maker of Middle Earth exhibition. And I was a little disappointed because I thought that there would be more Tolkien in library in bookstores, and I, I didn't see enough. I, I wanted to see more of Tolkien. I saw a lot of Harry Potter and, and, and things like this, but Tolkien, uh, unfortunately, many books uh, we still I, I still had to buy online uh, uh, through online stores. Um, I, I thought that even in Oxford. Uh, we have uh, uh, Waterstones, uh, Blackwells, it's very good, but still there were some books that I wanted that I didn't find there uh, at the bookstore. It's a were curious looking, fact. Were you looking for new books or uh, used books? No, new books. New books. Mm-hmm. Uh, but and, but generally has a good display. Yeah, in, in Blackwells, I found the only, the only one of the, the, the new edition of Companion and Guide, so I took it, and it, uh-huh. it's now here in Brazil, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> it, was, it was the last one or the only one in the store at that moment. So Black- uh, it's... Yes, go on. Blackwells usually have a good show, and they did put a good... Well, they certainly had a very good show of books 
when the exhibition opened, but whether they kept it the whole time, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's difficult now finding finding there were, there were copies of the companion guide in the Bodleian shop weren't there I'm not sure mm, I, I don't think I saw one there mm. they may have come and gone yes. I think we I think I did see something yeah. there at that time I think it was a, a, a new book a new uh, it was something new and so everybody went and, and took one it was about it was about uh, half a year old by that time. I think it became yes. like November of 2017. Yes. Yes. That's second edition. And the exhibition started in June, I think, June 2018. Yes. Okay. Cesar? But you you're talking about the three volume pack, but all the yes. books. Christina buy all of them. <laughs> she went yeah. to the bookshops before and took all of them. Yes, maybe that was the problem. Well, what what we can't show you. I mean, it's 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 very unfortunate that you know that we can't be doing this in the room we call our Tolkien Library, which is nothing but Tolkien. It's, it used to be our dining room. It could still be our dining room. <laughs> But well, it's, still it's, it's still is yes, but it's, <laughs> it's it's just Tolkien. It's not it's not everything that we have of Tolkien. Uh, oh there's more in this room, but uh, for some reason our Wi-Fi doesn't work very well in that room. Mm. Uh, so what we, uh, we're we're actually sitting in front now of part of our children's book uh, reference collection. Perhaps token spirit is, is there, so he doesn't yeah. like Wi-Fi, <laughs> all this kind of stuff. Yeah, could be, yes. Uh, it's it's quite a big room. There's uh, four four book, there's seven large, really large bookcases. Seven foot bookcases. And several low bookcases, and that has mainly the books by Tolkien. Um, the books, actually, the books on Tolkien are in this room. And the translations are down in the basement. Oh my God. <laughs> I have one shelf and I'm so proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> I have a very large collection of translations. I would love to see it. I love collections, so <laughs> don't count me that. The, and what, the, uh, what, um, what amazes me more wrong? is uh, what amazes me more is that we are talking to a first generation token reader, Christine, yeah. and she, she was there at the beginning. Uh, Tom Bombadil, uh, yeah. speak of Fulton Major. She yeah. saw all this this material in the bookstores at the time that Tolkien was alive. The Return of the King. Yes. She waited. <laughs> yeah, she waited. Yeah, it's amazing. It was. It's for... amazing. But I, but I didn't know. I just didn't know. I didn't know what I was getting into. <laughs> <laughs> no one does. Dangerous. Certainly not. <laughs> I just wanted to, to ask something. It's not on the um, the, the script, but uh, since we are talking about about uh, the, your experience, Christina, how did you how did you uh, feel when uh, you knew about, you know you knew about Tolkien's death death? I actually was actually at home at that time, and I I was pretty. It was pretty worrying. I mean, also sad because. Of, I felt I felt so much for him, though of course one knew very really little about him, no biography or anything. Um, but yes, I I can still remember my feeling and going out to, going out to buy the Sunday paper to get the to get the details on it, and wondering as we all wondered. And of course the uh, estate and. Uh, Alan and Rena Unwin did say something that they probably would be doing the Silmarillion. But yes, one wondered. It was like a sad for Tolkien, but sad also for us. Were we going yeah. to get the Silmarillion? Mm. And um, at, at that time, did, how did you know about Silmarillion? Because oh, there was no internet. There was there weren't so many books about it. Oh, it must have been in. Uh, I mean, they, they talked about that for a long time, and in in, 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 in the Tolkien Society. Or yes. that you weren't in the Tolkien Society then, no. uh, but it had been in the news uh, that you know that it was going to be uh, you know that Tolkien was working on it. I mean, I must have known because uh, um, certainly said something about it in the obituary. I, I, I'm trying to remember now if I was giving my dates right. Uh, it was about 1970 that that I read Tolkien first, 
uh, and uh, of course he died in 73. Mm -hmm. uh, and because I, I remember reading the obituary in the paper and that certainly talked about uh, uh, the Silmarillion and there was hope that, that uh, his son Christopher would, would, would complete it. Mm -hmm. Because he yes. gave a certain number of interviews and he had mentioned it in letters. So I suppose mm -hmm. that one gradually somehow got some information, but I, it's a very, very strange. I'm not quite sure. I couldn't put my finger on when I first heard about this. Uh, it, it's something that you live, but you don't really remember all yeah. the details. I, I know how it is. A long time ago. Yes. <laughs> Once upon Says a time. <laughs> and then and it was a bit of a shock when it came out because it was not quite what one expected. Yes, I, I, I can guess it. Um, there, there is no narrative, there is no narrative like the Lord of the Rings or the Hobbit. And then, of yep. course, we went one step further with the history of Middle Earth, which was quite a. But we then got, you see, once you got the biography in seventy seven, then you suddenly got a lot more, not more, but. Yes, it's it's. There were a lot. He did give a lot of interviews, and a lot of news. I think a lot of newspapers knew about it. Certainly, the obituaries mentioned Silmarillion so and what was going to happen. You didn't. Nobody knew what would happen. Mm -hmm. On letters, but letters is from seventy-seven. Letters is a no. The biography. Biography. biography yeah, the biography. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so. And, and about the collector uh, in other language, Ronald is inside his office and had many, many good uh, books in Esperanto, Germany. Ronald, can, can you talk about this? Oh, well, <laughs> in the presence of Wayne and Christina. But anyway, <laughs> I, 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 do, I do some collecting. I have the Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion in, and the Hobbit in German, in uh, Yiddish, in French. I'm looking at it now in Galician. Oh, mm -hmm. well, I'm, I, I try to collect. Being a translator myself, I'm a little critical about other people's translations, but anyway. <laughs> that is something that I find very interesting. How many uh, people who have started out as fans have become translators or editors? Um, for instance, the uh, I first met Michael Alstrom, Finland. When he was still at school, he founded the Finnish Talking Society. And he is now the talking editor for Finland. I know several of the Russians who've translated, oh. or I knew, not in, not in touch with so many of them now. And I'm still in touch with the Pope Agnieszka Silvanowicz, who is, has then been one of a lot of the Polish uh, translations. And then there are people like um, René Vink is doing a lot of the, of the Dutch now. So it's very interesting the way that um, the, fa the fans of the, 80s and 90s have moved into becoming the translators and the and to actually help dealing with publication. Yeah, actually, it's because it's the same, it's the same thing here. Yes, a, a translating token requir requires a uh, certain knowledge about his languages, and only a token reader or token hardcore fan to know more about about them. Perhaps that's a reason. Well, and it's also it's also uh, it's it's hard work doing it. So you know, if you if you don't enjoy the work to begin with, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it's going to yes. be even harder. And we love it. There, <laughs> uh, there is no reason for 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 a craziness. Definitely. <laughs> well, is my question now? I need to ask. What is the approach of working on Tolkien's one manuscripts and typescripts? Do you usually go to Marquette University or Bodleian Library and spend days visiting those places or someone send you copies of the pages you need? Please give us an overview of that. 
Well, both actually. Both, but these, but having stuff sent to us is more only only more recently has stuff. We were sent the stuff we we for the um, for the artist and illustrator. Um, I we had to, I had to go. We were still not, we was we were to sort of engaged sort of but engaged but we were still apart. And I was in England, so I did the work at the, at the Bodley going down there. Uh, Chris, we did get the help that Christopher lent us. That he'd had to, somebody had made for him a snapshot of all the art snapshot snapshots and albums with snapshots of all the art. Um, there were two copies, and he lent that to for me to work. But then I had to go back to the go to, for looking at the originals. Go down to the go to the Bodley. And I went there too when uh, I was able to take a holiday mm -hmm. in England. But for for uh, most things, we had to go to to market and to the Bodley. I think it the when we were working with Christopher on things, he would send us stuff if we if we some things. Yeah, please. photocopy. Um, but mm -hmm. we'd already. Well, of course, we started out with that. You went to, uh, we well, got permission for the Allen and Unwin correspondence, which was the first major when was, thing. When I was doing the bibliography, uh, uh, Rainer Unwin uh, gave permission both to see the uh, Allen and Unwin archive at the University of Reading, uh, which was a lot of fun. It was uh, at that time uh, with a, a, a number of other publishers' archives in their, in their basement. Uh, and we, we would go there and just, or I would go there and just, uh, we were allowed, or tr you know, trusted to just go down and, and work the day. Uh, and, uh, you know, boxes piled on boxes and, and uh, very wonky uh, compact shelving. And, uh, uh, but, you know, that's the sort of thing that uh, it, you have to go to because you don't know quite where things are. You have to learn the arrangement if there is an arrangement. Uh, and uh, you're forever, uh, you know, finding out one thing and that leads you to think, oh, well, I'd better look this up too. Uh, and so you go to some other file. Uh, but when it came to, uh, you know, uh, they, don't, they don't have that anymore. Um, they're much more organi organized now. And, um, you know, as the years have gone on, libraries and archives have, uh, you know, used computers, they've been able to do uh, you know, electronic catalogs and, and a lot more scanning. Uh, with the Bodleian, uh, we, you know, we would have to uh, request things uh, and uh, we were able to see originals. Uh, but if, it, if we had wanted copies, uh, it was a much more involved process uh, a number of years ago than of course it is, it is now. Uh, but even so, the, uh, the Bodleian and the Tolkien estate don't uh, just hand the things out. Uh, we've been lucky that we've, uh, a lot of our work has been you know, through, under the auspices of the Tolkien estate and for Harper Calm. The authorized publisher, uh, but you know we we have also been sent things, um, well, and, they, and that's been a been a. They sent us for the art of the Lord of Thing, rather art of the Lord of the Rings and the art of the Hobbit. They sort of just came through on the computer. Uh, they, and, had, they had high resolution. <laughs> that, that um, they, that but they we, sent to us, which Ma was which was is, is, is uh, you know really was a convenience. Marquette, yeah, especially since especially since I I actually. Uh, you know, set up the, the book myself in uh, on the computer in design. Uh, you you it's just, those were the sort of books and artist and illustrator before it, where you you basically had to uh, you know set up your graphics and then write to fit. Markets we used to have to, we sort of have mainly went there, but at the, just towards the end of doing the Reader's Companion, we were really running out of time, and trying to take down some of Tolkien's uh, charts for the timings and the rest of it at the end. We sort of said to, uh, um, we said to Kathleen, the Tolkien estate, do you think we could possibly have, could possibly have electronic texts for these? And they did do them. Um, so, I mean, that, that helped a great deal because I didn't have to take it all down like a, yeah, I can type very fast, but uh, but you know, know trying to do, but we were lucky. They but they've trusted us. You know, it's uh, 
we have to be very careful what we do. And they did let us see a lot, lots of the stuff that we saw for the, the, the companion and guide, like Tolkien's diary and some of the unpublished material. We had to get permission and we weren't sure, we would get permission to see it, but whether we would get permission to how much we would get permission to publish, we didn't really know until it. Uh, until uh, <laughs> how much of so, Tolkien's diary it, that there exists? Well, we're talking about, uh, we're not talking about Tolkien's, you know, actual diary, uh, you know, a day-to-day -day diary. We, uh, Christine was talking about, uh, he, there was a war diary, which is a very mm -hmm. short piece. Uh, and then there, uh, yeah, I imagine you were referring to, to the, the, Italian. the Italian trip to, when uh, Tolkien and Priscilla uh, okay. were in Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, and he kept a diary for that. Well, he didn't keep it. He wrote it up as a report up, afterwards. Yes. Yeah. So, but the, you know, he just wondered. But that wasn't that. What we, what really we had to do as well was everywhere in Oxford. We had to go and spent several days looking at the Oxford University archives. But that was rather nice because it was in Duke Humphrey. But we had to work all the way through all these That's the old, committee the oldest, reports. Oldest part of the uh, the the, the an old part of the Bodleian Library. It was it was the. Uh, <laughs> original for Hogwarts library in the first Harry Potter film. Uh, so that was mm -hmm. nice. We had to uh, look at all the English faculty committee reports. We went to the English faculty library for those reports. We went to Oxford University Press for the stuff that he did for, for, for Oxford. Uh, we, it, early English Tech Society. Yes. The Early English Tech Society. We had to go to, um, it was actually Christchurch where they were at that time. We went to each of his colleges. Um, this is why the book is so long. And we went to, we went to, <laughs> of course, the, as John Garth did, we went to the, uh, publish the English, the National Records. Um, well, you see, it was supposed to be, it, it, was, it was offered to us. It was the first thing off. After we've done the um, the uh, artist and illustrator, which is which is what Christopher asked us to do, and we were doing this, the first time we went to Harper Collins. After that, Rain around when it said to us, "Well, you know, the publishers need you as much as you need them. So take a list of things that you think you might like to do." And you know, so we did. Well, some of them came off, and some didn't. But one of the things that the Tolkien editor had, they had just published a sort of 800 page companion and guide on C.S. Lewis by Walter mm. Hooper. And we wanted to do letters, Tolkien's letters, an enlarged edition. It's the thing we wanted to do most of all, and we've never had it. Um, but in, he said, you know, but if you could do a Tolkien version of this, you would be able to publish or quote for more letters. So we were supposed, the companion and guide was supposed to be one volume of about eight pages. 800, 800 pages. Well, once we started digging into all these places, we realized how much information there was there, there was. And it just grew and it grew and it grew. And then it caught up, got caught up with the fact that we had also been commissioned to do the um, Reader's Companion to agree with the 50th anniversary of the Lord of the Rings. And yes, life it, it, was very scary. Yes, I mean, Typically, um, you know, a publisher will, will suggest a project or, or you know, take you on and, and assume that it's going to take a, a much less work than it actually will. Uh, but then we think that way too. Uh, and, uh, you know, th these things, they, they drag on, uh, not for many delay uh, on our part, but because th there's more and more material. Nothing is simple with Tolkien, uh, in Tolkien's <laughs> nothing. Uh, you think it's going to be, and it's not. Uh, I went into you know, writing the Tolkien bibliography because I loved The Lord of the Rings. Who knew Tolkien wrote all those other scholarly things? Uh, who knew there were that many translations? Uh, who knew about all the, the, the letters that were appearing? Uh, so, you know, live and learn, but you never, you never quite ex expect it. But the with the companion and guide, you know, which uh, Hooper had written, uh, uh, had uh, with Hooper, it was a sort of combined uh, uh, small small uh, small biography, 
uh, of, of Lewis, uh, together with a sort of uh, encyclopedia of you know, who's who, what's what, where's where. Uh, and but we thought if we did a small biography of Tolkien, it would really just be uh, adapting Carpenter. Uh, so th that's when we decided to do a chronology rather than a biography. And the chronology just kept growing to the point that we had to say to our publisher, uh, gee, sorry, uh, but the, the chronology alone is as long a book as you asked us for the whole thing. Well, they said, okay, let's have two volumes. Uh, and we said, okay, yes, uh, we will do that. Uh, and that we thought was going to be the end of it uh, once we finished that book. But then, uh, yeah, they, we, we go to see them and they say, well, you know, that's, it's out of print now. Uh, and, and rather than just reprint, you know, given that you two have been putting all of these addenda and core agenda on your website, uh, that so there's obviously more that can be done. Why don't you do a revised edition? Uh, and if you have to go to the third volume, uh, which we, we would have because we were at our limit, uh, okay. Well, yes, uh, but you know, other things uh, came along about the same time, and and you never, you never uh, realize, uh, let alone the difficulty in writing the extra material, indexing it at the end. Yes, she, she loves index, you can tell. <laughs> it gave me a heart attack. Well, no, it didn't. <laughs> she did have one when we were doing the first volume and, and I was, I was you know, finishing up the index in her hospital room um, on a laptop. No, I mean, it's, it's been very enjoyable, but there are times when we wonder, why on earth do we do it? <laughs> when, you, when you really find you're up against deadlines and you're, you know, what no, are you... Our publishers have been very patient. Mm -hmm. We've also had, I mean, very lucky to work so long with uh, Christopher. And, Christopher Tolkien, yes. And to have so much help from him. And... Um, what would be of, of all of us if it wasn't for Christopher Tolkien? True. Mm. Well, it was. That is right. I, 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 ju I just imagine uh, all the token editors think the same thing. These people going to make a book twice, twice of the size we going to, we agree with. The Lord of the Rings was just uh, yeah. Yeah. Hobbit <laughs> 2 and <laughs> take this volume, Christina and Wayne start to make some book with many pages and <laughs> twice. Don't think that hasn't occurred to us. Well, I think that we've often said that we feel that Tolkien is haunting us, not only because everything we touch turns out to be longer than we expected, <laughs> but also uh, the re we had to, because the Reader's Guide was time sensitive with 50th anniversary and the reader's companion reader's companion yes companion. sorry we had to lay it aside we to, to lay the companion guide aside to do, to do the reader's reader's companion and then we went back after a gap of about a year 15 months and as Tolkien says work laid aside is has to be almost done again because you don't know where you are and you're out of the rhythm of it how did we do this again what were we doing what were we <laughs> including how are we fighting these works not again not again <laughs> i do not want to do a third lot of the <laughs> guide i hope not there was such a lot though because christopher had done a lot since we um he published a lot of books yes he did and so much had come out i mean good christopher and ourselves um you know the, Tolkien fans have have uh, had their shelves filled up. That's yes, right. Um, I'm supposed to ask a question now, and the question is very easy to state and probably difficult to answer. But here goes: What fascinates you most in Tolkien's works? Fascinates. Hmm.
I guess it's an addiction, but I'm not quite sure. That <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I like, I, I enjoy, I enjoy, obviously there are various different s- styles. I think the Silmarillion took a little while to sort of take it. We, were to, we expected something like the Lord of the Rings and it took a while to become accustomed to it and to find out, find out that it has its own beauties, even though it's, perhaps less well, it's, it's, I can't say because it's very violent but it doesn't quite have the emotional pull of the Lord of the Rings where you almost feel that you're you know, traveling with them um, but and I enjoy I enjoy things even like Tom Bombadil the poet I like he certainly has a marvelous way with language and use of words they're fun and that's and people I mean they're, they're... I don't know about fascinated mm-hmm. people have often asked us, uh, you know, why do you like Tolkien? And uh, and my first answer is always uh, uh, that he was you know one of the great masters of the English language. That he uh, you know he, he tends not to be thought of in those terms, but uh, you know he knew it inside and out. Uh, and uh, but he had a, a facility with with the language that uh, uh, you know is hard to match. Uh, it's not for everyone's tastes. I, I grant you that, um, but it's uh, it's something that that obviously spoke to me. Uh, and uh, you know, it's uh, you, you you just are so grateful to him that that you know for having written these things. Um, uh, of course, uh, many of his colleagues felt he should be doing something else. He should be doing his scholarly work, but uh, um, you know, he he was actually. Uh, I don't know how he could get by with so little sleep, but um, but he did. Uh, but yeah, one of the great writers. Uh, you know, quite apart from uh, you know the world building, uh, the fact that you you know you could could create uh, something that is so co- uh, coherent. Uh, in a fantasy, um, which of course is uh, you know really related to to real life, uh, as it must be. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, of course, there it's uh, we've we've, well, we've we like the, we like the art too of the. Um, so, I mean, yeah. some of it is is sort of we say less interesting or less fascinating but there's some really beautiful pieces the watercolors Mm -hmm. if you see where you see the watercolors and things like the shores of fairy uh, he he really were incredible incredible i think i wanted to make the point that that uh, tolkien fans are are sometimes accused of not reading anything else Uh, and that's never been the case Um, uh, we found that the tolkien fans are often you know Great readers of many things. Uh, we have other other uh, authors uh, and, and artists that that we we like and and collect. Uh, the house is full of books. There's a, somewhere like twenty thousand books in this house. Mm. They all told me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, I can say by uh, about myself. I used to to read a lot of authors before I met Tolkien. <laughs> After yes. Tolkien, yes. perhaps a, a three of them. Uh, One yes. goes hoping to find somebody else, and you never find any, anybody yes. quite the same. Some people have a, a little bit that gives it. Mm-hmm. And some authors I, I read when I was younger, and I go back to, and I remember how, how you know, much I liked that book, and I think, why did I like that book? <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's the, that's the you know, part of aging. Yes. Well, it's yeah. such a wide, wor- worldwide appeal to so, to so many countries, and we're going beyond the European, but to the Asian. And they all seem to. It seems to have. It has an must have a human appeal. I think. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's universal. And of course, you know, some people will go more for, some people, yes, will go for languages. Some people will be interested in other things, but um, it does offer a lot of different, of different things. 
So um, the next question. Uh, in 2019, Tolkien's Lost Chaucer was published and this year, the nature of Middle-earth will be published with some writings that didn't make into the history of Middle-earth. Uh, do you think there is more unseen material by Tolkien that could be published in the future? Expanded letters. We have, in fact, we have incredible files because, of course, as we've done our research, we've gathered more and more letters. And for, for many years now, of course, anything that comes up for sale, we, uh, we, 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 we have files. We have two, well, we have that twice that they much. They can't of, see. No, they've got, you've got, you know, boxes full of copies of let, letters or partial letters. Some of, them, some, some of them come up for sale. Some of them where we've been to places to uh, do research. There isn't yeah, another Hobbit okay. or one of the rings out there. Uh, I can tell you that uh, there are, you know, sm shorter things that uh, Tolkien wrote that you know may or may not be published, may or may not be worth publishing. Uh, there's certainly his. Uh, uh, there's some scholarly work that ha that hasn't been been done, but it you know it's, it might be difficult to do. Um, there's the one version of Beowulf in uh, the, uh, the translation, first version. the alliterative. Yes. The Bavadian Fragments, which yeah. I always wish they would do because I like it, but Bavadian Fragments is where the, tr the traffic goes. So there's so much traffic that it completely buries the city of, more or less buries the city of Oxford and then they dig it up and they find the remains of the colleges. When, when you were doing your research, did you get to read the austerior motive? We did. It, it, how many pages does it have? Oh, I can't remember. It's not that, that long. No. It was talking. It was talking, blowing off steam. <laughs> I think it wasn't published until now because of the the way he talks about religion and and C.S. Lewis is there I, is something about it. I think there's a couple of things. There's also the other thing which comes up a bit with uh, Pauline Baines. Pauline Baines. I think mm -hmm. the talking was somebody who when he was annoyed, could blow up. And he would then write something and work it off. Mm -hmm. And then, yes. you know, it was out of his mind. He didn't like something that Pauline had done. He usually liked what she did, but he didn't like, didn't like the top and bottom of the map. The post map. And he sort of wrote his... And I, think <laughs> it, and I think the same thing happened with Lewis. And I think... Shall we say it wasn't characteristic? Wasn't really characteristic of him. It was him when he was at his worst, and I suspect mm -hmm. that's one reason why they have not been published. Yeah. It's, but uh, okay. but I, I, st I still believe that uh, the letters will be expanded someday. I, I, mm -hmm. I really believe that. And then, of course, there's the, there's poetry. Yeah. It's nice right. that those two poems that were found a few years ago, uh, it was because of when he called someone, uh, I think from Black. Yes, mm, well, we knew we knew Sisters of them. Mercy. In well, we knew about them. Uh, we knew about one of them. We knew that there was mm -hmm. a a uh, uh, an earlier version of Shadow Bride, uh, and we had an idea of where it might be published. And finally, uh, somebody got in touch with us. Uh, Pointing out a, a, a you know a, a likely source, and I followed it up, uh, and uh, we got pages. And there was not only that, but there was this poem Noel, uh, which I think was not known, um, and uh, that was really the the last of the known periodical uh, appearances by Tolkien. I mean, we knew it existed, but we didn't know exactly what it was. Mm -hmm. uh, the other the other problem child along the way was. Uh, uh, Tin Fang Noble. Uh, where was that published? And I finally figured that one out too. It, what was it? It was somebody. It was some, what was which Inter University. Was the, which, yes, but what was magazine. the Catholic newspaper that somebody pointed What's us tablet? to? The tablet. Yes, the Catholic newspaper, the tablet. They had done. They had somebody. They had been digitized, and somebody had gone through mm. and had picked up talking references, and it referred to the. Um, 
to the, these things that had that they Tolkien had had these published, and that's what enabled us to go and get the. There, were, um, there was a point early on when the tablet had been digitized and it was free online. I think you have to subscribe now, <laughs> but at that time, you could search it, and a number of things popped up, uh, and then you you know you follow one thing follows to another. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay. Okay, let's um, go. But we've, the, we, the, we, 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 after we finished our big lot in 2006, everything else has just come to us. We didn't put anything else forward. It's just come from them as they say, well, would you like to do this? Would you like to do this? And, oh, yes, we would like you to do this new. Re re <laughs> so, it's which is what pops out of the uh, um, well, either the computer or if we happen to be visiting Harper Collins, which we can't do at the moment. Nobody. Can <laughs> move. It's it's very depressing. Yes, it is. So let's go to the next question. Uh, how how was your relation? How is your relation with with the Tolkien family, uh, especially with the late Christopher Tolkien? How did you first get in touch with him, and how was your relation uh, relation with him along the years? Uh, well, actually, I first met Priscilla in 1980 when we were both on a tour of Andalusia, and so I was going around for at Easter. I was going around with, with this group. And I, I sort of knew her then on, on that. You know, we were going around together for two weeks together. And um, then when I joined the Talking Society, she used to, to entertain, used to entertain the, those who had, went to Oxenmoot to a buffet lunch on the Saturday. And I sort of met her again. And we picked up. Uh, and in fact, we remain in touch, and we usually these, these days, if we're, when if we're in England, we usually have lunch. Well, it used to be dinner with, have an evening meal with her, but it's now lunch. Christopher, well, but Christopher, in fact, really, he saw he there was you were doing the bibliography, and you were doing it with Doug Anderson, who was very much in touch with Christopher. Yeah, and he 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 sort of got Christopher to think about your bibli. You know, he. He sent us pieces of it to him, didn't he? Um, yes, he did. Uh, I think I met Christopher very briefly in 87 yeah. at, well, I did Mar too, yes. at Marquette, uh, for, which was the Hobbit conference, uh, the, the Mythopoeic Society, um, and then again in, in 92. But we, we had a little bit of correspondence in between because I was doing the bibliography and uh, you know, he took an interest in that. Uh, and uh, I was... I was in touch more, I think, with Rainer Unwin, uh, who was then still, uh, well, Unwin Hyman, I guess, by that time, uh, still in charge of the publisher. Um, but, uh, you know, Christopher then, uh, uh, really the 92 conference. Yes, but it, what I meant was he saw your work and he approved yes. of the, yes. because he was, he, you know, he was- We knew we were doing doing good work and, well, and doing it seriously. But this comes in where, it, this is what I say, is that you never know what's going to matter. When I um, got my uh, thing, I'm going to collect Tolkien. Of course, I also wanted magazines. And one of the ones that I subscribed to was Beyond Brie. Mm -hmm. And the first time that I, when I wrote to send the money to Nancy Marsh, uh, I made, it so happened that the Book of Lost Tales Part One had just come out. And I mentioned that I was reading it. And she's, as an editor of a magazine, says, please write me a review, which I did. And I reviewed every one of them as they came out. Now, that's important, it's significant because I was also, as you mentioned, I chaired the committee that ran, organized the centenary conference at Oxford. And I was, I was in touch with Tolkien, Christopher on and off about arranging for him to come. So we corresponded on that. And then when it came to the banquet, I and the other joint chair, well, we decided that we were going to sit on either side of Christopher. We'd done all the work, so why shouldn't we have have the advantage. So I was sitting next to Christopher at the banquet. And um, just before that, just before the earlier in the time of the conf 
of the conference, the exhibition, uh, the first Bodley exhibition, Tolkien exhibition opened and I'd had a quick look at it, but to go back. Um, so at the, at the banquet, of course, I was making um, conversation. Um, and to, to Christopher, he also happened to know that I worked in a museum because he had my, he had, actually had to phone me about something when there was something urgent came up, but he had my, all the contact things. I mean, anyway, you know, one of the things I said to him was, uh, you know, have you just seen this exhibition? You know, and I just wish we could have a book on the art. Well, he had also, you had me remembered from Marquette, he'd already more or less expressed the wish for that. He had done that uh, in 87, uh, the Haggerty Museum at Marquette had had a, an exhibition of Hobbit art, uh, and Christopher had said something there to the effect that uh, you cannot understand my father's uh, writings, uh, uh, you know, Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit, without also uh, appreciating appreciating his art, uh, and that's that stuck with us. So, but I, I'd seen things I'd never seen before: the Shores of Fairy and some of the fascinating things. And I said to him, "I do wish there could be a book for it." He said, "Well, that's what I want, but there's been there's a problem." He said, "We did try somebody, but the problem is that anybody who's going to write that, they have to be very knowledgeable about my father's works, but they also have to be knowledgeable about art." And they tried somebody from the Ashmolean who could do the art but couldn't do Tolkien's works. And then he sort of stopped a moment and he looked at me. Now he knew that I, he knew because Vance, because he's actually, um, if actually in one of our previous correspondence, he said he'd, you know, I'd done a very nice review for him and he'd done a pretty good. He knew that I knew the book of law, knew the history of Middle Earth. And he knew that I had an art history background. And he knew that Wayne and I were a pair. And he sort of stopped and he said, would you and Wayne be interested in doing a book like that? <laughs> As I said, I, it was well on in the banquet and I just stopped sliding underneath the table. <laughs> so it sort of... <laughs> and, and uh, you know, after and that... In this time, your soul pull out of your body and come back <laughs> after. <laughs> Uh, and, and, you know, as Christina was saying earlier about uh, after we did Artist and Illustrator, there were all these other other books and, and Christopher was our editor. Uh, so we were in touch with him about various things. We didn't always no, agree. Uh, uh, you know, we didn't always agree on everything, but, uh, you know, he, he would always allow us to make our arguments. And sometimes he would say, well, you're, you're right. You're right. And at other times he would say, no, you're right. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I'm right, you mean? <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> but no, one, I one mean, the other. But the, when we did uh, the Reader's Companion, of course, every, uh, or rather, when we, when we did the uh, edition of The Lord of the Rings and we're making uh, uh, corrections, uh, every point went to him as our editor. And uh, sometimes we were, we were hesitant to do something, and he would say, no, go, you know, we, this should be done. Uh, so it was a very, very close relationship. Uh, we didn't have as much correspondence in his later years as we now wish we had, but, uh, you know, he was, he was getting on and uh, we hated to bother him, you know, unless we really needed, needed an answer to something. Um, so it was, it, was a, it was a good relationship. Um, we, uh, uh, I don't think either of us met Michael. No, uh, Michael, I think, died before I joined the Tolkien Society or very soon after. Um, we know, know Priscilla, of course, and we knew Father John. And Joanna. And Joanna, mm -hmm. the granddaughter, and Simon and Tracy. And, uh, 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 you know, we had some, some, some of the Tolkien's and, and Rainer at our wedding reception and, and Pauline Baines, and you know, that was very nice. Um, oh, no, God. Do you all those names. <laughs> had those names. Oh my God. <laughs> so, had... do you? Hmm? Yeah, no. I, I'd like to know if there is. Do you think there's any chance of having Priscilla talking, talking to us, <laughs> uh, talking talk, or no way we can forget she, about I it? I don't know that she does this sort of thing. Uh, I mean, with she's you know, now computers in uh, she moved, had to move. She moved, had to move into sheltered housing. 
several years ago. She's uh, she she has uh, given up. She's oh. not the she's not the uh, so much the public face of the Tolkien mm. family anymore. Yeah, I think it's common among them. They they don't like too much to to go on and, and show their faces. Uh, I talked recently. Yes, to go public. Uh, recently, I, I sent an email to Michael Token, the grandson, and mm -hmm. he uh, invited him to talk to us. And unfortunately, he said, no, I don't do this kind of things. But we think it's because he doesn't know us and he doesn't know, uh, he, he doesn't know what we're going to do with what he says. Maybe well, I'll, I'll try to convince him <laughs> a little more. I think Priscilla might, I don't know, I mean, she's still very bright. But I think she might find it. After all, she's getting like she's getting to ninety, isn't she? I think I think she would be perfectly capable of doing it, but I don't think that she. she uh, it's, a, perhaps it's, it's her choice. It's not. It's yeah. not. Uh, yeah, not yeah. I, got, I got it. Uh, and maybe that she would need somebody to to deal with the computer and the device, perhaps. Yeah. You can only ask. Well, it would go. Yeah. No, I. I mean, one of I've been having the one of the things I've been doing. We've had a couple of things where things came up. And we knew that Christopher had given us a piece of information, or Priscilla had been giving us a piece of information, and we didn't know exactly where they were in the correspondence. And I've been having sort of spending part of this uh, sort of imprisonment. Indexing. Uh, Indexing. She loves index. Dealing with our letters, mm -hmm. our correspondence. And there were times when I felt quite exhausted <laughs> because of it was the period when we were doing so much. And how did we manage it? I don't know. I have no desire to do it again. <laughs> I imagine. My last shot. Well, Christina we and Heyman, please. In the Adventures of Tom Bombadil, there is a poem called The Mule Lips. Mm. Some people believe that these, cre these creatures are the orcs or something else. I believe that many elements found in this poem, like gold, cellars, doors, could be connected to, to the Baron Whites and the ancient treasures of Cardolan. What you? What are your thoughts about them? It doesn't seem likely. Uh, I mean, when you know that the background of the poem is, you know, uh, you know, someone knocking on a professor's door, um, uh, and only was was uh, you know transformed into the mulips for the the sixty two collection. Um, I don't think Tolkien. Uh, uh, he could have, uh, you know, imagined it that way if he'd put it to him, I suppose. But um, I don't, th I don't think he was thinking of those those things specifically. No. So we thought you because were all these poems. <laughs> Christina, you, you have any thoughts? No, I, d I don't. I, I, th I mean. I can see that I can see the connection between the uh, the Barrow White and the um, but the Bombadil precedes Bombadil poem precedes the, no Bombadil no, poem. It's, it's the Mulips came came from one of those Oxford magazine poems. Yes. another one of them. But, uh, I don't. It don't, didn't really. The history doesn't have any connection to uh, to, to mm -hmm. Middle Earth. It's sort of sort of. Yeah, you know, I, I think it. Sort of the, and um, in the rational uh, way, definitely, because you you explain this in the in the expanded yeah. uh, version. But we know that Adventures of Tom Bombadil is a just some um, mix of many uh, works of many dates mm -hmm. and talking some. Um, é, Ronald, por favor, fala que ele costurou para fazer caber no legendário. The microphone. Okay, the microphone. Sorry. Uh, what says uh, uh, 
said just said in Portuguese is we know that uh, the adventures of Tom Bombadil is um, is a patchwork of mm -hmm. uh, poems which were created before the Lord of the Rings, after the Lord of the Rings, and that they were more or less uh, pressed, compressed into a a, a more or less coherent, mm -hmm. a, a more or less coherent form to fit into a book. So you can't really expect. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Caesar, but you can't really expect. Uh, perfect uh, coherence between uh, among yeah. the poems themselves and between the poems and the Lord of the Rings and the rest of the legendarium. And Tolkien didn't think there was either. I mean, uh, he complained but, about it. But what is interesting is, am I right? He didn't when we to. finally sorted out, there was the problem of them reversing the order of the poems. But I think that the when we, I think I'm right that when one finally sorted out what we ha what had to be done, I don't, do you know that they switch the order of the poems in the second in the second printing of Tom Bombadil because the picture came Cat in the wrong time. But I think when you work it out that is the is the mulips is it the mulips or is it the cat? It's the only one that has no comment in the that that has no comment. The mulips. Mulips, no comment in the, the preface lips. because I think he felt it fitted all right, but. He couldn't explain. He couldn't really fit it Hobbit-wise. I believe she, he doesn't think about the Baron Whites, but some kind of way seems to, okay, let's go this, something but, like that. But of course, the Baron Whites were also there within the Tom, Tom Bam, Bombadil poem. Yeah. Ronald? Um, yes, um, I'm a bit uh, jumping about in our script. Um, Christina and Wayne, um, I know this has been a long time now. Uh, we are talking about 1992, but what curious or interesting fact do you have to tell us about the Tolkien Centenary Conference in 92? I mean, how was the experience of organizing such a huge event and to be part of such a huge event, even though it's now 30 years ago? Well, of course, one didn't couldn't enjoy it as much as one might have because one had so many other things to do. Um, but it was it, we were incredibly lucky to have perfect weather. There were some problems which we had to deal with. But yes, it was it was a great success, I think. And one thing that happened is uh, when we were leaving, finishing, uh, Rainer Unwin came up to myself and somebody else, I think, and he made some sort of comment. You know, he said, "Well, you've really put uh, put the you know the society on the map now. We're really on. We used to think you were just a little uh, <laughs> one of those things we had to cope with." All these mm -hmm. all these pe funny people dressing up in costume. <laughs> um, it was it was rewarding but very exhausting. I can I imagine hmm? the, the yeah. cover the cover of the booklet is so beautiful with many uh, oh, characters the, the, and um, the, um, the souvenir book. Yes, uh, yes. Win, win. Wayne Both. edited that. Wayne edited the souvenir book. I asked Pat to, you know, if he could do that, and uh, he just uh, had this, has this wonderful imagination. Yes, it was wonderful, beautiful souvenir book. No, okay, I, mean, uh, I, I, I could, I'd love to attend that attend that conference again, just as <laughs> as a guest, a guest, and not have as not have to worry about doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it was uh, all the fun where, when we are behind the, the scenes, so to speak. <laughs> uh, in the last years, some voices kind of criticized the way Humphrey Carpenter port portrayed J.R.R. Tolkien's life. Uh, how relevant do you think his biography still is and what can really be criticized in that book? Well, for one thing, Carpenter had to do it very quickly and 
there were many things that were not, there was much information ava not available to him. For instance, the university archives that we used would not have been available to him because they were closed. And so, in fact, if we'd wanted to look at the period when Tolkien came back a few years after his retirement, we couldn't have looked at those because there was a 30 or 40 year embargo. Gap embargo. The same thing with the war records. He couldn't look at the war records. They only became available. Um, things. So, the, the, I mean, even we had problems. We, we couldn't find out as much. We made some errors about stuff at St. Andrews because we, we wrote and asked them questions and we got no answers. So we muddled some things up. And a few years later, when somebody else wrote, they got the answers because of electronic digitizing. Mm -hmm. So one, I'll give you, you've got to remember that Carpenter didn't have the access and he had to do it in a hurry. He did have access to all of the Tolkien papers, but, but that's, a, the, that's a lot of papers. And for him to have done this you know, in a couple of years, uh, you know, when the papers were still in a, in a, uh, a fairly haphazard state, uh, it's quite an achievement. Now he, he uh, you know, he, he does put things a particular way. He has his, his opinions and, uh, uh, you know, they, they are, uh, his bias maybe isn't, isn't uh, the correct one um, when you start looking at it. Uh, but, uh, you know, we found some errors in, in, in his work, but uh, by and large, I mean, he wrote a very good biography and it still holds up and it's still the source for uh, a, a lot of the information that we know about Tolkien. Is currently the main criticism, and which I think is is to a certain extent valid, is that he tended to to not real, realize how he tended to portray Tolkien as not really being concerned in anything except his subject, rather than uh, that. He, well, as, I don't know. Have you been inspired by Holly Oldway's book? Uh, I didn't find, find it here yet, but I know about it. It's the modern reading. Tolkien's modern. modern reading. Yes. yes. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, she takes Carpenter to task and uh, probably rightly so in, in, in to, some, to, to some extent. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, showing that, that uh, you know, things could be interpreted in a different way. Um, mm -hmm. Um, you know, but uh, I think it's still a good biography, even after all these years. It's not it's not the only thing that one wants to go to anymore. Um, Edwards would be Edwards is certainly Edwards. a good balance for yeah. it. Um, don't bother with Grotta. <laughs> uh, but mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, it's I, I think, you know, Carpenter gets a lot of criticism. He also gets criticized for uh, what's not in in the published letters. But uh, they, that's, that, I think, was not entirely his fault. Mm -hmm. The book had a limit, and uh, Greener said to his letters tend not to sell. And they didn't. And they didn't. There wasn't a paperback for time. about 10 or 12 years, right. which shows, because everything else came out. And they chose to limit uh, or to at least focus, uh, for, for the most part, in the letters on material that is about Middle Earth. Uh, so a lot of his, uh, you know, his correspondence regarding scholarly things, or even with his publishers, uh, wasn't included. Um, but even that, you know, we were we were quite happy to have it at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, Nice. Okay, now it's me. <laughs> uh, we want to ask you what do you have to say about the forthcoming The Lord of the Rings uh, TV show by the Amazon Prime Video. It is something that you will uh, watch or not? Shall we just say that we never looked at the Hobbit films <laughs> and we only looked at the Lord of the Rings once? Yeah, we understand that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we really don't know. Fair enough. Fair enough. It, it's going to be a while before the, I think the Amazon series comes out and, and you know we don't know exactly what's going to happen with that. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, it's, it seems to us that it's likely to be uh, the equivalent of fan fiction. Um, it may be good fan fiction. Uh, it may be a good mm -hmm. takeoff on it, or it may not be. Um, we don't. We don't uh, tend not to have the, the streaming services anyway. So, uh, uh, but we'll. I'm sure we'll hear about it when it does come out. 
Yes. Yeah. I'm very, very, very worried. <laughs> <laughs> very much so. We will um, see, we will see. Okay. Uh, let me, the last question, uh, because we are both long-time collectors, token collectors, and I think this question is appropriate to, to end the interview. Uh, can you give us an estimate number of books by and about token you have? And also, uh, what's important to have in mind if a person wants to collect token? Is it necessary to buy everything that says token on the cover or even to have the same book with as many different covers as we can? Please give us some tips. Nothing, nothing is necessary. I mean, there are people who collect only one, one of the books. Don't I say know. that. <laughs> yeah, I feel uh, guilty. No, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not at all. I mean, it's, it's I'm uh, kidding. Like, you know, we we tend to be completists, but but and we're you not, needed it for for doing the bibliography. That's, that's, he that's, needed that's early her, on. That that's her. Mm -hmm. We need it for, for the bibliography. Now we need it for the second edition, whenever that may may be. <laughs> uh, but. Um, I mean, even we've cut back, uh, you know, that we're certainly not buying every book about Tolkien. Uh, there's, you know, now with self-publishing, anything can be published. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have kept up with the new editions uh, and so forth, at least of the, the main titles. Uh, but no, it, you, you collect what, what you're comfortable in collecting, what you're interested in and what you've collect, got what space for, what you've got space for. Yes. Not everybody uh, yes. has for things that are oh, it's, uh, I, I mean, it used to, it used to be you were lucky to get one book a year out, and you sort of mm -hmm. really read that book and absorbed it. And now they're pouring out more and more of them, and it's, it's almost, and these books of essays. They tend, I tend to find that if the, so many of these books of essays, there are two or three that are really good and a couple that might be, and a lot of them are really not. <laughs> not uh, but how, how, many, how many books you know, we have, how many volumes we have uh, by or about Tolkien? I, I think you did an estimate. I actually, I, did, I, I gave up on, on, um, I gave up on uh, number. I did do on a blog in which I did shelf length for books and shelf lengths for boxes, which sort of gave up linear feet. Linear feet. Well, you can translate that into meters, um, which uh, did a, as I say, well, yes. Oh, don't try to ask the <laughs> <laughs> Christina, you're so adorable. <laughs> It's, uh, well. Well, uh, so I have to ask, th that was the last question, but, and I'm, I'm crossing through Ronald's question here, uh, about the, the current and future projects. I know we want the second edition of the, the, the bibliography, and you always have to, to answer this. And also about the Pauline Baines, Baines, Baines book. Oh, now that he can that well that that yes that I've been working on. Uh, that, that's the that a lot of that is done. Uh, I what I've left for the last is uh, dealing with all of the Narnia books uh, because mm -hmm. it's it's such a complicated uh, publication history. Um, but you know, it, it'll get done. I'm, st I'm still working. I'm still I'm still a librarian, so I haven't retired yet. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if we if we got more projects, I probably would have to in order to to do that. But uh, um, that's that's really what we've got going now. And, uh, and do we want? We still want the Silmarillion, a reader's companion by Wayne Hammond and <laughs> Christina Skoll. Please do it. That would be interesting because of the. Uh, I mean, you, you have a lot of uh, connections with the history of Middle Earth. Uh, we did suggest, in fact, a, an art of the Silmarillion, but of course, there's a lot less of uh, Tolkien's <laughs> original art for that. Uh, but well, it, we uh, need it anyway, so <laughs> go for it. <laughs> <laughs> but to a certain, I mean, to a certain extent, there is a guide to the Silmarillion within the companion and guide. I mean, it was very, very difficult sorting out how to deal with the Silmarillion because you had to deal with the Silmarillion, the history of Middle Earth. It took me a long while 
thinking about how I would tackle it. I did, I did that. I worked on that while Wayne was still doing another bibliography for another author. Um, and, you know, eventually came round to that I would have to do it chapter by chapter of the Silver Mil Silmarillion with individual entries for every element of it and then do the chapters. No, I can't start from the st start because there won't be a start to start with for certain aspects of it. So give the, give the, the summary of the Silmarillion chapter and then go Trace back the and work it, all yes. the way up. And it took a lot of work on that it, within the, the things. It's almost a, a guide to it. But of course, that was done in, that was done before all the, uh, that was done before all the elements 20 were years ago. that we had to bring it up to date. Mm -hmm. That was the things we had to, we had to bring ourselves up to date. Yes. <laughs> Uh, see, uh, Christine and Wayne, I can't thank you enough for talking to us this evening. It was such a pleasure, uh, so much knowledge, so much memories. Uh, I'm fascinated. I think my colleagues, my friends here think the same. Uh, I expect you more times here in Talk and Talk uh, to talk about specific subjects. Yeah, specific to, show, to show us your, your rooms, your libraries. <laughs> we would love yes. that. <laughs> Show your collections, perhaps the the most the rarest books yeah. you have, and it's very interesting. It's it's very nice to talk to you. You are so important to to the token community, and that's what we want to show to our followers uh, in, at our channel. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. I'm so happy today, and I'll let my my friends say goodbye to you, Ines. Okay, so before we, we, we end this uh, interview, as said, you said, I, I, can't, I don't have words to, to speak. I'm fascinated with your story. Uh, we are, you are, you are an adorable couple. I, I love uh, hearing your, your stories. Uh, and you have so much to, to, to teach us. I feel so grateful to, to be here with you. If I, can, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I loved it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. I want to thank you also for being with us uh, tonight. Sorry, Cesar interrupted you. Uh, and I'm very proud now of uh, that uh, Christina remembered me from way back when. I think this must have been like 40 years ago. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Wayne, also for being with us here this evening. Thank you. I'm elated. Uh, I... I'd like to thank you, your time, your kindness, um, so, so gentle. All the, um, the questions was answered with some detail, so care. Um, we talk about you both in many of our videos and it's a, a great pleasure to give a little bit of uh, many stories I know you have just the the top of the iceberg. I know we have so many stories above that. And our our door, our circle door is always <laughs> open to you and the tea is on the table. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you guys for being here with us today. It was such a pleasure to be here with uh, Christina and Wayne. We hope to have them uh, to have them again here with us. And this is a nice journey. Um, we have so much to learn with all these uh, talking needs. And I hope we, we will receive more, more, more people. So thank you for me being here with us today. And see you in the next video. You know, all the links will be here down below to help us through our social media and other ways. So thank you and bye. See you in the next video. Un gran beijing. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs>